start it and all right and we're recording now too all right well we at least have one person signed in i know we have a few more people uh who had registered uh so we'll give it another minute or so uh but welcome to uh the computer science webinar uh focusing on transfer students and transferring into the program my name is uh, Teresa Abbott. I'm one of the Associate Directors of Undergraduate Admissions in the Admissions Office. And I have some folks here um, from the Computer Science Department. I'll give you guys a chance. You can go ahead and introduce yourselves. Um, who, And we'll be able to kind of talk about the uh, transfer process, the Computer Science Department, and answer any questions that you have. We are recording this, so uh, feel free to keep your camera off if you don't want to be recorded, or if you'd like to turn it on, you're more than welcome to, to make it a little Little bit more conversational, um, but I'll turn it over to uh, my folks from computer science to introduce themselves. Sure. Jen, you, do you want to go first or go for it? You can go for it. All right. <laughs> All right. I see someone else just joined. Welcome. Um, let me turn my volume up so I can hear things a little better. So yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Goldschmidt, and I'm in computer science. So I'm one of the, uh, on the faculty my um, title is executive officer, which really means nothing. <laughs> the translation is that I um, am focused on uh, teaching, you know, classroom, et cetera. I don't do any research and instead I'm really involved in um, undergraduate education. And also I advise all the transfer students coming into our department. So keep everyone on track and figuring out what courses they need to take and so on. So, so happy to answer questions. Jen Yu, yeah? Yep, my turn. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jen Yu Zhao. Um, I'm uh, one of the advisors in the School of Science Hub um, at Rensselaer, and I also advise all the undergraduate CS students. Um, so we also, like, um, coordinate some of the events like this and, you know, like fun event events for our current students um, and so uh, some recruitment events for uh, prospective students. So happy to be here today. Um, if you ever have questions about, you know, how to add a major, like a different major as a dual or interested in like exploring other area, interested in doing like a minor in other disciplines or other schools, um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have about that too. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna start by um, sharing my screen um, so we can go through the little PowerPoint that I have um, uh, that I have scheduled. There we go. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're gonna be talking um, about um, computer science at Rensselaer um, and kind of from the perspective of like a transfer student. Um, a little background on Rensselaer. Um, Rensselaer is a medium-sized research university that's really dedicated towards the undergraduate um, education. And so uh, we're a medium-sized institution, around 6,200 students in the undergraduate population, around 1,300 students in the graduate population. Um, we currently have students attending from really all over the country and all over the world. Um, our undergraduate students come from all 50 states. Um, we, at the undergraduate level, represent 19 different countries, but when you pull in graduate students, it brings that number up to 60 different countries. Um, there are a lot of opportunities for students to participate in co-curricular activities such as research, uh, study abroad, co-ops, internships, clubs, different student organizations, and we'll touch on some of them um, throughout the rest of the presentation today. Uh, but there's a lot of co-curricular activities that students can get involved in while they're at Rensselaer. Rensselaer was founded in 1824 by Stephen Van Rensselaer, really for the purpose of instructing persons in the application of science to the common purposes of life. Uh, Rensselaer um, was the first school to do lab-based learning and the first school in the English-speaking world to give a degree in engineering. We're located right in the city of Troy, which is right in the heart of the capital region. Um, while most of student life does uh, happen up 
uh, on campus itself. There's a lot to do in Troy, the capital district uh, in general. It's a uh, very young kind of college friendly population in the capital region. Um, there are um, 18 different colleges and universities. So between Albany, Troy, Schenectady, the local area, um, there are a lot of other uh, colleges um, and college age students. Um, where we're located um, is about three hours from New York City, Boston, and a little bit over from Montreal. So you do have easy access to those high energy metropolitan cities. Uh, but we also offer more of the relaxed lifestyle, being one hour from the Adirondacks, the Catskills, the Berkshire Mountains of Massachusetts. We're also not too far from the Green Mountains of Vermont. So any type of outdoor activity, skiing, snowboarding, hiking, or backpacking, you definitely have the opportunity to do that in this upstate New York area. Um, in downtown Troy itself, there are a lot of different restaurants and shops, places to go out and eat. So students do often enjoy going into downtown Troy. Um, the Troy Farmers Market is very popular. Um, it's every Saturday morning year round. Uh, many students like to go out and, you know, go down and check out some of the vendors, grab breakfast, lunch, um, listen to the music that's playing. Um, it's a great social activity to get involved in. Um, the last Friday night of every month is Troy Night Out, so businesses stay open later, do special discounts uh, for students and community members. And Troy itself hosts a number of different events throughout the year, like the Rockin' on the River music concert series in the summer, uh, the Troy Pig Roast, uh, the Chowder Fest, Victorian Stroll around the holidays. So there's definitely a lot to do in this um, upstate New York area uh, in the area surrounding Troy. On campus though, there's over 210 different clubs and activities. So art, music, drama, community service, multicultural clubs, honor societies, a lot you can get involved in on campus itself. Looking back over time, Rensselaer alums have quite literally built America. I'm from Amos Eaton, who is the co-founder uh, of Rensselaer, who was also a surveyor for the Erie Canal. George Ferris, who invented the Ferris wheel as a graduate of Rensselaer. Um, J.E. Johnson, the co-founder of Texas Instruments, is a graduate of Rensselaer, um, the inventor of sunscreen. Uh, Mary Ellen Rathbun um, was one of the first women to graduate from Rensselaer in 1946. Um, and since she graduated, many amazing women have followed in her footsteps from Claire Frazier, who's a pioneering genome explorer, to Carly Streif, who's the inventor of the Bark Box. Rensselaer has really always been uniquely well suited for the development of inventors, entrepreneurs, uh, visionaries of all kinds. Um, at Rensselaer, there are five different schools or academic programs of study. So we have the School of Architecture, the School of Science, the Lally School of Management, which is our business school, the School of Engineering, and the School of Humanities, Arts, and Social Science. Um, and Rensselaer is very interdisciplinary in the fact that there are low walls and boundaries between these different schools and different departments. So it's very popular for students to take classes outside of their particular major of study, dual major, major and minor across the different disciplines. Um, we're gonna focus today on computer science, which is in our School of Science. Um, so I'll turn it over to uh, Professor David Goldschmidt, who will talk a little bit more about uh, the computer science department at Rensselaer. Um, so I am sharing um, the screen. So if you just wanna tell me when, I'll, uh, I'll, sure. I'll be able to switch slides for you. That sounds perfect, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, so computer science, um, a lot of times people will sort of think of RPI and think of engineering or RPI as an engineering school. We happen to be the largest major though in computer science here in the School of Science, uh, which happened a couple of years ago. Um, and so what that hopefully means is that our curriculum sort of is, um, and you know, and the faculty and everything that we're doing sort of is, is you know, um, broad enough and sort of covers enough of the other disciplines that that we sort of um, end up with, you know, so much interest, right? So CS in general, um, I guess by sort of the, the definition right on the slide there, sure, it covers design, analysis, implementation, so actual coding, and just sort of, again, sort of a broad application of, of anything to do with computing to um, all these other fields. Um, you know, I, I know we're in a time of COVID right now, and by the time, you know, presumably maybe in the fall, we're, we'll be much more back on campus. The second bullet item here really, um, in terms of the preparation that a CS degree 
you know, sets you up for. We have our career fairs is what I'm thinking of um, every semester where one of the largest spaces on campus is filled with, uh, Teresa, you probably know the numbers, 250 plus companies every time. And most of them, you know, are looking for CS in some way, shape or form. Um, so again, you know, our, our curriculum sort of designed not so much with that end goal in mind, but but as luck would have it, you know, CS is so broadly applicable, right? So, uh, so we, we offer through our coursework a, a good balance between, you know, both theory and practice. So a number of our courses are, are more on the theory side of, you know, computation, theory of computation, um, computability, uh, certainly complexity, which then leads over to the practice side, you know, uh, if we come up with these algorithms and solutions, for example, can we actually practically implement them? And then how do we scale them in sort of a real hardware sort of um, or involving hardware as well and so on there. Uh, we do all this with only 19 full-time faculty, uh, five full-time lecturers. So I technically am one of the lecturers. Um, I don't do any research, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and in general, hopefully I've been conveying here that last bullet item as well, our curriculum uh, offers a good deal of that theory as well as sort of um, applied theory, you might think of it, you know, or, or practice, practical application. Um, and that sort of, that that picture that was shown a slide or two ago with sort of the other schools and the, the low walls that um, Teresa mentioned, I mean, we, we have a lot of dual majors. And it's a bit tougher, you know, admittedly for a transfer student to jump in and, and cover two majors in the, you know, shorter amount of time, the, the fewer number of semesters that you have here. Um, but it's it's still often within reach, um, especially if there's a bit more overlap, for example, like mathematics um, or one of the other sciences, perhaps. Right. Uh, but our curriculum in general is really designed to support, you know, applying or using our, our CS expertise in other fields. Um, so anyways, if it's worth is it worth clicking on the curriculum link there, maybe the template, if that'll work. If not, no worries. But I just realized that's hidden in there. If not, no worries. I can describe it. Maybe it's coming up. But essentially, it's just the um, on our website we show a curriculum template for each year. Um, you know, and then it can change from year to year. So, curriculum template just summarizing all the courses that you would need to take, um, all the options that you have within. You know, choose from a list of courses, etc. Are you seeing it or is it only showing my PowerPoint right now? I think it's only showing the PowerPoint, but but right, that's okay, you know. Stop and I'll reshare yeah, okay. the uh, that link that I just that I just clicked on. Okay. Sorry, we didn't we didn't plan this. <laughs> I showed up at five fifty nine, so all right, here we go. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so it essentially what I just want to point out here, a lot of these courses, um, you know, again, our, our names, so CS1, data structures, foundations, et cetera, a lot of those as a transfer student, you might very well, you know, already have taken at um, you know, whatever school you're coming from. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of detail there. So I invite you to sort of look at the templates online and, and feel free to reach out sort of offline uh, with, with maybe more detailed questions. Um, or if you have some, you know, as, as we're doing this session, but uh, but essentially, as a transfer student, we'd sort of figure out first, okay, what of all these courses and various requirements can we sort of check off or cross off the list? For example, math option one, math option two, you might have some math courses that line up there. Um, the Haas courses, which are humanities, arts, and social sciences, of course, free electives, and then see sort of what's left over. And then that can, from there, map out, you know, your own semester by semester plan. Um, and there, partly I show this at the bottom, you see there's a lot of free elective slots. Um, and that's, you know, again, for all of our students, including transfer students, you know, that gives the flexibility to potentially dual major in something else, or at least get a minor in some other field, some other discipline. So, so that's partly why I wanted to, to bring that up. Page two, you don't really need to, yeah, we could maybe click on that. I mean, that's where a lot of the details are. So as you're looking at the templates, you know, look to page two for a lot of the more, you know, lower level details, um, which I'm guessing we won't get into today. But but if you have questions, glad to glad to dig in. So. All right. So while Teresa is switching back, then um, I will also mention so dual majors somewhere around 40 percent of our students overall, you know, of our undergrads are dual majors. So, again, it is a 
uh, something to consider even as a transfer student with you know your fewer number of semesters and you got to make sure you get all the courses you need so all right cool thank you what do we got on the next slide let's see perfect okay so actually i guess sorry i went to the template i guess it's summarized here as well right so there's six foundational courses cs1 data structures uh, which cover Python and C++ essentially in both of those foundations or FOX, uh, F-O-C-S is um, really discrete mathematics course. Uh, computer organization is more our hardware level course, um, assembly language. So as I'm sort of describing these, you might realize, oh, I already took a course like that, like this. So, so again, some of these you might walk in the door with. Intro to algorithms um, is, uh, well, as the name implies, looks at algorithms, looks at algorithm design, looks at uh, complexity in, in a lot of detail, gives us really the uh, the theory side of how to compare algorithms and make sure that, you know, what we're coming up with is really going to work in practice. Uh, principles of software is the, the sort of first finish line in terms of the introduction or introductory courses, and that gets into uh, some Java, object-oriented programming as sort of a a, a larger scale, uh, build systems, uh, version control, program proving. So proving that, and we can't do this in a large scale very easily, but, pro but proving that sort of this function or this loop is going to do you know, exactly what we think it's gonna do. So actually proving that code works. So starting to talk about you know, scaling up, testing, uh, those kinds of things as well. And then um, two required courses in the upper division, so 4,000 level courses are in operating systems and programming languages. And those, I guess maybe from the names, you get some idea what those courses cover. In brief, OPSIS gets into really lower level C uh, systems programming. Um, so uh, creating multiple processes, multi-threaded programming, dealing with files directly, um, memory directly, shared memory, um, et cetera, et cetera. I teach that course usually, so that's I can go on for ages about that, but I won't. <laughs> Prog Lang, programming languages, uh, gets into sort of the underlying constructs, um, the theory of a lot of sort of language design, and then with some practical, you know, applications of specific languages. So beyond those, you know, all those various core courses, we then uh, require each, you know, each student to take four um, upper level courses. Um, at a minimum. Most students will, and again, even, you know, you have fewer semesters, but most students, including transfer students, will take, you know, more than just four upper level CS courses. You know, usually once you get rolling and you take, you know, this course in machine learning, this course in AI, this course in data mining, you know, you want to keep going um, and take more and more. So, um, and then last thought with that is that we also, so I guess as you're looking at, you know, what courses we offer, you can go to the catalog, you can find that pretty easily online and look through our courses. Um, there are a number of courses each semester that are not in the catalog yet, right? They're a new course that a uh, professor, you know, maybe involved with, with their research wants to, wants to try out. Um, and so uh, some courses each semester will be, you know, completely brand new, I guess, right? So we're not just even limited to the number of catalog courses. So. Anyways, uh, the other thought there, too many thoughts keep popping into my head, is that we also have courses from other disciplines that we cross list in CS. So there might be a course offered in engineering or um, uh, well, computer systems engineering, IT and web science, uh, the games program, um, cognitive science related to AI, you know, that we cross list and we'll say, sure, you can take that other course and we'll treat it as a, one of these upper division CS courses. Um, so once again, since CS sort of is so broad and, and can easily sort of encompass all these other disciplines, your sort of set of courses you have to choose from, you know, broadens as well. Um, what else here? Let's see. Well, so math courses, four math courses are required, Calc 1, Calc 2, and then two additional math options or math courses there. Uh, three science courses, so physics 1, uh, biology and biology, or yeah, intro to biology and intro to biology lab. Um, and then a third course, some other course in uh, the sciences and not a computer science course. Um, 
so again, it, with with most transfer students that I see coming into CS, you know, there, there's some mix of math and science courses that you're bringing in, um, and then as well as the next, you know, bullet item, the six courses in Haas, the humanities, arts, and social sciences, um, and then beyond that, you just need to get to an overall total of 128 credits, so you have free electives to fill in the rest of that. Um, yeah, I guess next slide. What else we got? <laughs> what else? So, so I guess I'm not sure when we should take questions, but but start thinking about what questions you might have. Happy to get into Q and A in a minute. Maybe um, I'll just describe a few other things. So I mentioned a, a few minutes ago that uh, we are the largest major now on campus. So all of our undergrads are over 1,300 undergraduates um, in the you know the four years. Um, and each of the incoming, you know, first year freshman classes have been the last few years, you know, getting close to and then exceeding 300. Um, so we've been scaling up all of our courses accordingly as best we can. There are a number of, you know, non-classroom kinds of clubs and organizations just within sort of our department um, that are listed here. So the first one is ARCOS, or RCOS, uh, Rensselaer Center for Open Source, and that that organization is uh, we it's you get course credit for it free elective credit and you work on a project um, each semester if you want you can take it multiple semesters and work on some open source project uh, that either you have in mind or some project that already exists and a number of those projects um, don't let me go too far down this path I could spend hours talking about this as well but a number of those projects are sort of RPI uh, specific. Like they, um, like the shuttle tracker to track where the shuttle buses are. So when it's you know cold and raining or snowing out, you know when to run out the door and catch the shuttle, right? You have it on your phone, on your you know as an app. Um, or we have uh, course schedulers, so the the administrative sort of systems that you use to register um, that the school provides, you know, admittedly only go so far. So students have built some very cool and very easy to use interfaces to search courses, to create a schedule, um, come up with the best schedule possible, and so on. So there's a lot of sort of, you know, within the walls of RPI projects, and then there's plenty that go beyond, you know, out in the world of, of open source. So anyways, that's that. I would highly recommend that even, um, again, you know, even if you're here for four semesters or whatever, uh, often, you know, an employer, potential employer, is going to be asking you, you know, oh, cool, RPI, your GPA looks good, this looks good, that looks good. Tell me about some projects that you've really been involved with. So Arcos is a very good place to get that project experience, that sort of, you know, real world working on a team kind of uh, experience. All right, a bunch of others. Again, sorry, I go into too much detail probably. Um, so ACMW is uh, the women's chapter of um, well, ACM. Um, RPI Security Club, Hack RPI, let me see, CS Club. So some of these like ACMW, uh, the CS Club, um, UPE, our Honor Society at the bottom there, you know, they, among other things, you know, sort of look to offer uh, tutoring or um, exam review sessions before CS1 or data structures exams. So there's a lot of sort of uh, overlap there, you know, people involved in these clubs that then look to what we're doing academically. The RPI Security Club actually often ties in um, with the operating systems course, as well as a few other courses, because we're really digging into the lower level. You know, how do we break this thing? How do we break into this system? What do we need to do to guard against that? Um, so in, in past years, RPI SEC has gone to various uh, competitions and, and either won first place or done very well in terms of, you know, um, Essentially, at these competitions, I've never been, but the, there's like a machine that has various levels of, you know, how far can you get in. Um, so anyway, some of that does, we do talk about some of that in the OPSIS course. Anyhow, so that's a fun, cool club to be involved with. Hack RPI, we have um, a hackathon that we do every year um, that the students, you know, in that organization put together. And essentially some weekend, and it's often tough to figure out which weekend to do this on, but some weekend we have a lot of other people coming from all sorts of neighboring schools, 
obviously with COVID, we did it online this this past. Um, yeah, when did we do that last fall? Um, sometime in the last few months. Um, but anyways, whether virtual or not, all coming to campus and and just working on you know if you've if you've been to a hackathon, just working on some project twenty four seven for two days in a row. So a lot of good energy there, and a lot of good sort of um, you know results and projects come out of that. And that's often tied the number of students in Arcos as well, right? Working on projects uh, that are open source. CS Club mentioned a little bit about already. Um, I'll actually be syncing up with them next week and just uh, meeting with you know with whoever wants to show up to that to talk about advising for fall registration. Uh, but they again do you know various kinds of events and and also help uh, tutor. Coding and Community is a newer organization which uh, essentially you know goes out into the community um, K through 12 really K through six kinds of schools um, and tries to help you know by offering um, you know here's how to program in Python or something very simple so for you know some very simple sort of uh, initial CS education to communities um, you know surrounding communities uh, UP is the honor society um and again that's a, you know a good resume builder right it shows that your grades are good and you're getting you know involved in a, an organization um that offers tutoring and has other resume mock interview events um so there's a variety of things there um what else peer programming mentors assigned so one thing we've we've tried to do is have you know especially for first year students is try to get them you know synced up with um with sort of uh, in their courses in their core courses synced up with other students who have already taken those courses right so there's there's peer programming mentors that are there again either physically or virtually now um, you know in the labs helping with cs1 helping with data structures helping with intro algorithms and just you know helping to to get unstuck in whatever code you're looking at so um, anyway, so a number of students will, you know, take a course or even transfer students walk in the door with credit for a course and then, you know, sign up to mentor for that course and help other students um, in that class. So that's a, another good, um, fun as well opportunity. All right. How many more slides do we got? No, I'm only kidding. What do we got next? Um, so Essentially here, I know we sort of talk more generally now. I mean, so CCPD is one of the offices um, that offers sort of some resume help and also syncs up, primarily syncs up with, you know, companies for internships, co-ops, and so on. ALAC is another key resource that um, that you'll, you'll find in terms of getting tutoring services, either um, in larger groups for some of the intro courses, or um, or individually in some cases. And then Gen U and a, and a handful of other folks are in the School of Science Advising Hub. Um, so Gen U, I don't know if you want to jump in and talk about the hub at all or? Uh, yeah, happy to. Um, so I introduced myself earlier. Um, so I'm one of the four advisors in the advising hub in the School of Science. So kind of like serve as a the divisional advising center for all the undergraduate students in the School of Science. Um, we see all the majors, um, but also advise students who are interested in, you know, transferring to School of Science or declare any major or minor in School of Science. Um, beyond that, we also uh, plan some programs. Um, we we'll try to do that once a month uh, for any student who are interested in doing like early arch, for example. Uh, the ARCH program, uh, we're going to talk about that uh, late, uh, but basically it's a program that um, the, 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 uh, the sophomore students will stay over here on campus over the summer taking junior level courses and they're going to be away either in the fall or, the sp or spring in their junior year to have some kind of co-op or internship or study abroad experience. Um, so like uh, we plan some programs and to help students who brought in you know, more than 20 credits, for example, um, who can do early arch. So uh, we can, uh, you know, help them to plan out their studies so they can graduate um, in three years. 
and we also plan some programs to prepare students for career fair, for example. Um, also connect students with other resources on campus, um, things like that. That's it. Cool, good, good. And let's see, the other thing mentioned here on this slide anyways, is uh, just a, a link you can go to, you know, offline. Uh, finding our site is very easy. You know, search for RPI Computer Science if you haven't already, and you can dig through a bunch of information there. But sorry, yeah, Teresa, next slide, let's see. Next, um, so I may have already mentioned uh, some of this, some of this may become repetitive, but our, our sort of core courses, or maybe I didn't mention that core set of CS courses that I described does have sort of a, a rigid prerequisite chain. So part of the uh, challenge coming in as a transfer student um, with the hub or with me as well as, you know, as your official academic advisor in CS is coming up with a semester by semester plan. You know, so if you start with a certain course, you can't take the next course until the following semester, of course, so we, you know, need to map that all out. Some courses are only offered in specific semesters, as you can see there as well. So, for example, Principles of Software and Opsys are both um, spring-summer courses, and then Prog Lang or Programming Languages is a fall-only course. So that means that, you know, you got to map it out, and also means typically you're looking at four semesters you know, certainly depending on what um, what you're bringing in, right, for credits and which credits they are. Um, and I, I also note here the last bullet item, there is a, a maximum that the registrar um, or the school will set as to how many credits you can bring in. So if you happen to, you know, have more than 64 credits that you can transfer in, you need to figure out, okay, which ones will I bring in and which ones will I you know, not bring in, right? Um, and, you know, once in a while, we might change that further down, you know, when you realize, oh, wait, I should bring this one in instead. You know, we, it is changeable um, later on. So even if we, you know, make our best guess initially, you know, it's not set in stone necessarily. So, so anyways, yeah, those are two key things to, to keep an eye out for, right? The prereqs um, for each course, and then also which semesters they're offered in. All right, yeah, next slide. Let's see. All right, so a little more detail. Um, so transfer courses for the first course, CS1, um, a transfer course there will be some introductory programming course. Uh, our course is in Python, um, so it could be in Python. It, I probably should have had Python on the list there as well. Um, but it could also be C, C++, Java, some other, even Scheme is not unheard of. So some other, you know, fairly prominent programming language. Um, uh, CS1, though, can also be skipped. You know, you don't need to have credit for CS1 if you already do have some significant programming experience. And typically, you know, we sort of equate that to roughly a year, maybe a, a course or two that really is truly, you know, uh, programming focused or an experience or two. You know, maybe you've had an internship or just on your own have just been you know, coding up some various projects or some various ideas that you had, right? Um, or I've, I've seen cases as well where, you know, out of a mathematics course or a science course, you know, you start to automate some things or, or simulate some things or do something with code that really, you know, gets you taking a deep dive into programming. Um, anyway, so CS1, you can skip that if you don't have credit for that course and start with data structures instead. Um, and detail there, I guess it's the last bullet item on the slide here. If you do decide to skip CS1 and you don't have some credits to fill that in, transfer it in, uh, you will need to make up the CS1 credits just with some other CS credits further down the line. Um, so typically that's another course, or it could be mentoring credits and independent studies. So really any sort of 2,000 or 4,000 level uh, CS credits. Um, all right, and by the way, the third bullet item there. So typically, if you're gonna transfer in a course for data structures, um, typically two courses at other schools, you know, combine to obtain that credit. So oftentimes um, it's um, sort of a second semester programming course, as well as a really in-depth C++ object-oriented course that combine together uh, from another school that gives you, you know, the data structures credit. So if you, you know, if you've been out on, on Reddit or anywhere else and you read 
rumors about data structures, how it's really, really challenging and it takes endless amounts of time, you know, these two dimensions of all those rumors are, I'm here to tell you, are true. So it is a very challenging course. Um, hopefully, and I hear this, believe it or not, um, hopefully a rewarding course after the fact. You know, it's, it's a grueling course to get through. Uh, but once you're through that course, you, you should be fully confident that you're going to you know, be able to succeed in the other coursework and everything else here. So um, anyway, so, so definitely, you know, as you, as you look, you know, potentially for your starting point as well, CS1 or data structures, that's a conversation that anyone in the hub or, or I can have with you in terms of where to start, right? If you're not transferring in CS credits um, or you're transferring in, you know, very few CS credits, you know, we can look at that. But um, the other thing, the fourth bullet item, therefore, is very important, right? Even if you haven't programmed before and you're transferring in, you know, a bunch of other credits uh, for other courses, that's, that's fine too, right? So CS1 would most likely be your starting point. And it generally assumes you haven't really programmed before at all, right? Um, so I always say, you know, transfer students to this group, to all, you know, freshmen coming in as well, to all the groups coming in. This, the right starting point is wherever your starting point is, right? So if you're starting in CS1, perfect. Um, if you're starting in data structures, perfect. You know, if you've got credit for those and starting in one of the other courses, that's also, that's also fine, right? All right, so there's sort of the CS1 versus data structures sort of slide. Um, all right, what do we got next then? So I guess, yeah, so fast forwarding a little bit to the other side of your time here. So we have uh, a co-terminal program. So, and what that essentially is would be one additional year of coursework to then earn also your master's degree. And um, essentially with this, the... Um, well, first of all, the second bullet item is probably very good to read, right? So financial aid typically will, will continue on into this additional fifth year of study is for if you start, you know, as, as a non-transfer student, I guess, typically. Um, so that's more the the template that you'll see online. Um, but as, essentially the way you sort of um, get into this program is that as you're working through your 4,000 level, your upper division CS courses, for your undergraduate degree, you might realize, wow, this machine learning stuff is really, really cool. And you start interacting with the, with the instructor, with the professor, and try to work out, hey, I'd like to continue you know, working on this. Um, can you recommend other courses that I should take? And I'm also interested in, in working on a master's degree, you know, some sort of work in this field with you. Um, and so that's part of the process to sort of lead to a co-term. So you can see that bullet item there, a faculty recommendation is required. But that's where you get the faculty recommendation, you know, in one of their courses. And that's typically how that works. Um, as an alternative, you might also be, you know, some internship on campus where you're working in a, a, a research group. And then you decide, you know, with that faculty member and so on that you want to turn that into a co-terminal master's. So sort of two pathways typically into the co-term. Uh, the other detail at the bottom there, so applicants, you know, must have 90 credits. Um, including, you know, transfer credits. So you need to be at the 90 credit mark or beyond, um, you know, in your undergrad degree. And then your GPA here needs to be at least 3.5. Um, I think overall the school requires 3.0 as a GPA, but many departments, including CS, require 3.5 as the threshold. Um, and if you're awfully close, you know, uh, let us know. The person who, who works with the co-term applicants, you know, even if you're close, we usually have... Um, yeah, I want you to apply, so. All right, and then the next slide, I think, is sort of our, our transition back to Teresa, co-terms, intern, or co-ops and internships. I'll mention briefly again, the, the career fairs are really the, one of the key ways of, of syncing up with, with these companies, but. Oh, I should keep talking. I, got nope, unmute. I was just go. trying okay. to figure out how to unmute myself. Yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> it uh, I felt like my screen froze for a second. Yeah, so Rensselaer offers both internships and co-ops. Um, the main difference between an internship or a co-op 
is um, the amount of time you're going to spend working for that company. So an internship is a few weeks, a few months or so. A co-op is a summer and a semester. So you're essentially taking a semester and a summer, whether it be the summer and the fall, the fall and then the following summer, or the spring through the summer. Um, but you're going to be working for a company for about six to eight months, really getting a more in-depth view of um, what that company does and getting a lot more hands-on experience. Um, you could do, you know, one internship while you're at Rensselaer. You could do numerous internships. Um, co-ops, after doing one co-op, it, it could get into delaying your graduation, but it's really all about how you want to manage your time and your schedule um, and what you're interested in getting out of your education. Um, these are some of the employers that are specifically hiring um, students from computer science for both internships, co-ops, and jobs post-graduation. Did you have anything else to add in, Professor Goldschmidt, before I head on and talk about the ARCH? I, I don't think so. There, maybe one other just uh, minor point that comes to mind is that often alums, and sorry if you just said this, I don't think you did, but alums will be at the career fairs. They'll be the ones behind the tables, behind, you know, in the booths saying, yeah, I just graduated two years ago and I'm working at XYZ company and it's awesome and we're looking for, you know, and so on. So. So that, that sort of feedback loop is really cool. I like wandering around. I'm not looking for a job, but I like wandering around and seeing, hey, I remember you and so on. So it's, yeah, it, anyways, I'll, <laughs> I'll leave it at that, right? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. I know um, some of our um, sororities and fraternities host their um, alumni weekend around the when the career fair is going to be because they know that um, many people will be in town for the career fair. Um, and it's, you know, a great idea when you get to Rensselaer, if you're a part of a mentorship program or a part of any of the different clubs on campus, become friends with that senior that's about to graduate because oftentimes down the line, they're going to be the folks that are going to be looking at your resume and, um, you know, meeting with you at the career fair. Great point. Um, so going on to talk about the ARCH, um, which Jen, you uh, mentioned a little bit earlier. The ARCH is um, a unique way that Rensselaer's uh, academic curriculum is set up. The way it's set up is kind of for traditional incoming freshmen that you're on campus for your fall and spring of your freshman year, sophomore year, and then you spend the summer on campus after your sophomore year as your first semester junior year, um, taking a full semester's worth of classes. And then um, what happens in what's traditionally your junior year is you spend one of the semesters, either the fall or the spring of what would traditionally be your junior year, off campus doing some sort of off campus hands on experiential learning. So this could be an internship, this could be part of your co op, it could be doing research or some sort of uh, travel abroad experience, community service, anywhere along those lines. Really, it's something that's going to enhance your education. It's a way for you to get hands on learning uh, prior to graduating from Rensselaer. As a transfer student, your participation in this program really depends on the number of credits that you come in with. So technically, to be considered a transfer student, you need 12 transferable credits after you graduate from high school. So if you graduate from high school, you go to a college or community college for one semester, you take at least 12 transferable credits, which is essentially full-time. Um, so you have one full-time semester at another institution, you can then apply as a transfer student. And we'll get into the whole application process in a minute. Um, but if you were to transfer after one semester, um, you would be required to participate in the ARCH because you would be coming in as a freshman um, <clears throat> and you would just kind of get in with your cohort of other freshmen and study at Rensselaer the same way the rest of your cohort is. So if you come into Rensselaer as um, an incoming freshman, either fall or spring semester, and even if you come in um, as a sophomore that first semester, chances are you're going to participate in the ARCH because you're going to be with uh, the rest of that cohort of students. If you were to come in as a junior, so you have 
four full semesters at another institution. Um, and all of those semesters are transferable into Rensselaer. So that's typically around 64 credit hours, which Professor Goldschmidt was saying is the maximum number of credits that you can come in with. If you come in with all 64 credit hours, you're going to be coming into Rensselaer as a junior. So typically you would already kind of have missed or be passed that summer arch semester. So then you would start at Rensselaer um, in the fall and participate, you know, participate in, you wouldn't participate in the arch, you would study at Rensselaer for the fall, the spring semester of junior year, and then fall and spring semester of your senior year. Um, and your advisor, um, the Office of Student Transitions, um, us in the admissions office, uh, will work with you to make sure that you have all of the appropriate information. Um, it's all based on how your credits transfer into Rensselaer and how your credit evaluation process is and, and what cohort you're kind of clustered with. Um, but we can certainly answer individual questions on this. Um, it's a pretty unique experience. Um, so it's great if you are on campus uh, as a, you know, freshman and sophomore and able to participate. Um, but if you didn't, you still do have the opportunity to participate in internships or co-ops over that summer um, after your junior year uh, before your senior year. Um, this is a picture of the career fair you can see during non-COVID times. Um, it's uh, very exciting, very busy. A lot of uh, businesses come on our here interested um, in meeting with uh, prospective uh, stu or students when they graduate, prospective uh, employees. The Center for Career and Professional Development really works with students um, from the time they get to Rens Rensselaer all the way up through graduation. Um, they host one of the career fairs on campus. Um, they do different interviewing skill seminars, resume writing, um, critiques. Um, there's um, more than 500 companies that recruit from Rensselaer every year. So I think about 250 come to the career fairs, but they have um, businesses that um, post jobs on uh, the Handshake website. They have businesses that come and do interviewing on campus. There's an interview center. Um, so there's really a lot of great ways to connect with uh, businesses on campus. Um, these are just um, a few more examples of some of the businesses that are hiring from Rensselaer, as well as some of the top graduate schools. Um, many of the businesses that are hiring from Rensselaer are hiring from all of the different degree programs. So uh, the slide we showed earlier was um, ones who are specifically looking and hiring for computer science, but many businesses um, are hiring from all of the different degree programs on campus. All right, so going to talk about the application process. Um, when you apply to Rensselaer, you can apply through the common application or the coalition application. We don't have a preference which one you use, so whichever is easier for you to complete is just as easy for us to review. We have no preference which one you're, um, you submit to us. We look at them all equally. You can apply for either the fall or the spring semesters. Um, Rensselaer has a rolling admission process for transfer students. So the deadline for fall admission is June 1st. Uh, spring admission is November 1st. Um, right around now is when we're starting to review applications for the fall. So the deadline isn't until June 1st, but you can submit your application at any point. Um, we haven't quite yet started reviewing applications, but we're gonna be starting within the next few weeks. Um, once your application is in, we start reviewing um, applications and your application is complete, uh, you'll receive a decision within about two to three weeks. Uh, and um, so you, we will kind of begin rolling out decisions in probably about two or three weeks um, and we'll continue rolling out decisions through the beginning of June. The same process is for the fall. We usually start in the beginning of October and review them out through the beginning of November. When you apply to Rensselaer, um, we're looking for you to submit your application. Uh, we're looking for you to submit your application fee, your college transcripts. So any college that you've attended, we're going to need all of the official transcripts. So even if in high school you took one class through a local community college or through a, a local school, um, we're going to need the official college transcripts sent from each of those schools directly. Um, we're going to need a letter of recommendation from a professor, advisor, academic counselor, um, and then um, you, for computer science, you don't need to worry about a portfolio requirement, but we do require them for architecture, game design, and music. Um, if you have less than four full semesters of college work, so you have um, only been at um, 
you know, co in college for a few semesters, um, but you don't have two full years of work, we're also going to need your high school information. So we'll need your official high school transcripts. Um, and for this year, we are SAT optional because of everything that's going on with COVID. We know a lot of the testings uh, exams have been canceled and students have not been able to submit them. So we are optional for uh, SAT or ACT scores for the fall 2021 and spring 2022 semesters. Um, if you've taken them, you did well, you want to send them to us, you can certainly submit your scores. We'll take them into consideration. Um, but if you have less than four full semesters of college work, we're also going to be taking your high school uh, transcripts into consideration when we review your application. Once we review your application and provide you with a decision, when you're admitted into Rensselaer, we will begin processing your credit evaluation. To get an idea of how credits have transferred in the past, you can go to our transfer credit course guide at go.rpi.edu slash credit guide. Um, that will show all of the courses that have transferred in the past. So, uh, or how they have not transferred in the past. It'll pretty much list all of the classes that students have tried to transfer in the past and whether or not they transfer. And if they do, it'll show what they transfer in as. Um, so if you want like to get an idea of how some of your classes transfer, you can certainly go ahead, take a look at that um, website. You just have to look up the state and the school that you attended and a lot of the information is in there. Schools like Hudson Valley Community College, strong, strong majority of the classes have been reviewed and are listed in there. Uh, class, uh, schools that we don't have as many transfer students from, um, not as many classes are, are listed. Um, so for the classes that we have not reviewed yet, we're going to need all of the course descriptions for those classes. So you can just send us um, a document, you can include it with your application or send it once you get your decision. Um, but what we'll need you to do is to go onto the course catalog of the uh, school that you attended and just copy and paste the course descriptions from the classes that you took. We will have these uh, uh, course descriptions reviewed by our faculty members on campus to see if they're equivalent to a course that's at Rensselaer. In general, if a course covers the same material as a course that's offered at Rensselaer and you receive a C minus or better, you'll receive academic credit for that class. Um, so a, a few examples, sometimes um, from certain schools, two classes at, at a community college may only transfer as one class at Rensselaer. I think Professor Goldschmidt was saying that earlier about um, one of the um, CS uh, intro courses, I believe. Um, and so that, that's pretty common um, depending on the the, the class that you're taking. Um, it's, it's pretty common um, in math as well. Oftentimes, um, you know, a general Calculus 1 class will transfer as Calculus 1 to Rensselaer, but Calculus 1 at two, and 2 at many community colleges will only transfer in as Calculus uh, 2 at Rensselaer, um, just because of the what are, is covered in Rensselaer's Calculus 2 class is not always the same covered in other classes. But in general, if the class that you're, you took covers the same material as a course that's offered at Rensselaer, you'll receive academic credit uh, for those classes. Um, you do need to receive a C minus or better. Um, but once we um, process that information, hear back from the faculty members, We'll create a credit evaluation worksheet and a degree, a degree works degree completion sheet. And so you'll be able to see a list of all of the classes that you took and how they transfer into Rensselaer. And then you'll be able to see all of the courses that are required for the computer science major at Rensselaer and how those classes fulfill those requirements. Um, that will prepare you for a meeting with your advisor um, and prepare you for orientation. Um, orientation will happen usually a, a few days before classes start. Um, in the past, it has been, you know, on campus, in person, you get to meet with your advisor. Um, I believe this upcoming um, summer, we're planning for it to be virtual again, just because we don't know what the COVID uh, social distancing protocols will be. So we're planning right now for it to be um, virtual as it was this past fall and spring. Um, once you hear from us uh, about your admission, you are, your information is sent over to the Office of Student Transitions. The Office of Student Transitions is really a great point of contact for you to refer you to all of the appropriate resources on campus. They uh, assist in um, kind of your next steps of adjusting into Rensselaer. So they plan the orientation, they connect you with your advisors, um, and uh, they uh, kind of assist 
assist you with those next steps of everything you need to do to enroll and start your classes at Rensselaer. A little bit about financial aid. Uh, Rensselaer offers both need and merit-based aid. Um, the need-based aid is based on the FAFSA form and the CSS profile. And then as long as you're a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, you're automatically considered for merit-based aid based on your application. So there's no additional forms, applications, anything that you need to complete. As long as you're a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, you'll automatically receive that merit-based aid when you apply to Rensselaer. It'll be based on your grades, recommendation letter, all of that information um, that's listed on, uh, on your application. Um, we do have a few transfer specific scholarships. Um, if you are part of an affiliated institution, we have three scholarships uh, that someone at your school can nominate you for. We also offer the Phi Theta Kappa Scholarship, uh, which is a $5,000 scholarship for students who are in Phi Theta Kappa. Unfortunately, we are not open for visitors at this time. Um, we know it is difficult to try and decide on a school without actually visiting, um, but we uh, have a great virtual tour listed online. It's a great way to explore campus, see inside some of the buildings, uh, see what campus looks like. So definitely recommend going on to check it out. Go.rpi.edu slash tour is kind of the straight chat website you can use. Um, to sign in. And um, it's a great way to kind of view campus um, during these COVID times. Um, these are a number of different ways to, uh, for you to connect with us. Um, we are very active on Instagram. So please follow us at RPI Admissions. Um, I think Women in Computer Science is doing a takeover coming up the uh, end of this month. So um, please make sure to follow us um, at RPI Admissions. It's a great way to connect with current students, to connect with faculty and staff members. Um, we constantly have students faculty and staff doing takeovers and are posting a lot of information about deadlines, events, all of that. Um, and uh, there's a number of different other ways to connect with us. The custom view book will give you your own personalized view book with information on Rensselaer. We have recorded all of the webinars that we've been doing for the past year and posted them on our YouTube page. So that's another great way uh, to connect with us uh, is, you know, going on checking, checking that out. This is all of our contact information. Nick and I work in the admissions office, uh, specifically with transfer students, um, and then Professor Goldschmidt and Jen Yu's uh, uh, contact information uh, is there as well. Uh, but we can now turn it over to see if anyone has any questions on anything that um, we discussed. Uh, I know we shared a lot of information, um, but if you do have um, any questions, please feel free uh, to type them into the chat box or to, uh, you know, broadcast uh, your video. Um, we are recording this, um, just so you know, um, but feel free to reach out and, and let us know what kind of questions you guys have. There's that pause. I do have one, one thing to throw in the mix while you're maybe typing in your questions um, related to the... Um, if you find a course that you feel like maybe you could transfer in, but you don't find it in the transfer guide, um, the CS courses do end up coming to me. And sometimes I'll, I, the description is not enough and I'll go Google around and try to find some more information. So, so the more that you can share, like here's the syllabus, here's the schedule of what we did each week. Even for some cases you might be asked you know, by someone like me, what was some sample assignment, just so we can really see what is covered, because often the description, it might be too vague. Um, so if, for what that's worth, hopefully that, that helps some, you know, reduce some of the back and forth of figuring that all out. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great point. If you do have all of the syllabuses um, and sending that instead of the course descriptions, um, it is definitely a great idea. I know oftentimes we do go back and forth. We need the syllabus, then we email the student, they send us the syllabus. So yeah, if you have the syllabus uh, and you can send that to us from the beginning, definitely please do that. Also, um, I think I mentioned I'm a division advisor. Um, so I forgot to let you know, like all the students will have a faculty advisor assigned to them. So if you have like 
two majors, for example, if you are like math and CS. So you have like two advisors, one from CS and one from math. So uh, Professor Goldschmidt is actually uh, advise all the uh, transfer students. So that's great that you're attending this session. You know, you already get to know him. Um, so just email him. <laughs> Definitely don't be shy. I get a ton of email, but I'm glad to, well, read and filter most of it and ignore most of it, but I will reply to your email. <laughs> Uh, and by the way, for what it's worth, and for a minor, you wouldn't be assigned a, an academic advisor in that other discipline, but within each, probably at the school level, like the School of Science Hub, the School of Engineering Hub, um, the School of Haas Hub, and so on, they can help, you know, figure out what four or maybe five courses you need for a minor. So you don't get a specific advisor assigned in that case, but. All right, that might be it. I don't know. Questions? Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions come in. <laughs> don't any be shy. <laughs> yeah, please don't be shy. This is what we're here for. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ria. I have a quick question. Uh, it's about the official transcript. So when is the best time to send them over? Because I just uh, was waiting for my college to finish and then send them in. Or should I send in them just now? Yeah, so um, have you submitted your application yet? Uh, yes, I submitted my application during January. Okay, yep, um, and I'm assuming you're applying for the, the fall 2021 semester. Uh, yes, I'm a prospective student. For okay, yeah, so we will start reviewing your application um, really at any time once it becomes complete. If, you're, uh, if we don't have your transcript, um, we won't be able to review it until we receive that. So it's, it's up to you. Um, many times students who have two years under their belt will send the transcript that they have um, now and we will review their application. If we feel we have enough information to make a decision, we will provide you with a decision um, and it'll be all like pending that you're, you successfully complete this semester. Um, if uh, this is your first semester of college, we're gonna wanna wait until we, uh, we have the final grades. If we're looking at your transcript and we feel that we need to see your final grades from this semester, we will add that to your checklist um, when you sign into your admissions portal. And uh, we, will, uh, we will add that to your checklist saying that before you get your decision, we'll need your final transcript. Uh, and then we'll provide you with a decision as soon as we get that. Um, so uh, it's up to you if you wanted to wait until you uh, got your final transcript from the semester, you just won't get a decision until after we receive that. So most of the time that's not until May, so you probably won't get a decision until the end of May, beginning of June. Um, you, so it, it's kind of up to you. If you were to send your the transcript that you have now, we will need you to resend your transcript once the semester ends um, because we'll need to enter those grades into our system. Um, yeah, I mean, I already sent my unofficial transcript, but not the official one. I was just confused about that. Okay, yeah, so we um, we have been accepting unofficial transcripts uh, for just the review process because of COVID, but we will need the official transcripts from all of the schools, um, essentially because we need those official transcripts to see the grades because we're giving you transfer credit for those classes. So uh, that we'll need the official transcripts from every school you attended. So if you're, um, you know, at your first college, um, it'll only be that one transcript, but if you took any college courses in high school or you transferred any college courses into the school that uh, you're at now, we're gonna need the official transcripts from each school um, because we'll need those uh, official grades from each school. Um, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I do see a question in the chat, um, oh. which I can maybe recite. So for dual enrollment students, is it good as, uh, to apply as a transfer student or as a, a freshman? I think that's what the question is asking, right? What's better to apply as purely as, as a transfer student or as a, I guess, a non-transfer first year, four year student? Uh, yeah, I can, I can answer that. So uh, you're considered a um, 
transfer student once you have 12 transferable credits after you graduate from high school. So if you're going to be graduating um, from high school at the same time as you're graduating from uh, college, uh, typically we tell you to apply as an incoming freshman. Um, now there may be certain circumstances, um, but typically you're not considered a transfer student until you uh, have 12 transferable credits after you graduate from high school. So um, if you are dual enrolled, typically you would still apply as a freshman into Rensselaer. If you come in as a first time first year student, um, the maximum credits you can transfer in is 32. Yeah, that's a good point. So it is different. Um, incoming freshmen can transfer in up to 32 credit hours. Transfer students can bring in up to 64 or half of their degree requirement, pretty much, which is pretty much 64 credit hours uh, for most majors. But kind of the, the typical rule is you can bring in up to half of your degree requirement. You can't bring in more than half of your degree requirements. So you do have to spend uh, two, four, two full years or four full semesters at Rensselaer prior to graduation. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I do have one more. Sure. Uh, so if you're getting as a junior, so I don't know if I got that right or not. So you don't, you're not eligible for the ARC program during the summer than other semester? So if you come in um, with two years underneath your belt, um, you'd essentially be starting in the fall of your junior year. So you would have essentially missed the ARCH program. Um, do you, uh, Professor Goldschmidt and you, I don't know if you have any other information about it, um, but typically, you know, especially if you're not getting your decision until June, the ARCH program would have already started. Uh, but I'll turn it over, see if you guys have any um, information on that. Yeah, I mean, typically if you're coming in um, as a junior, then the ARCH wouldn't really be necessary, I guess, right? So you're not I want to kind of say you're not missing anything, right? In that you'll take all your courses fall, spring, fall, spring, um, either four semesters or maybe a fifth semester. And then in that summer, typically between, you know, fall, spring, fall, spring, between your junior and senior year here, you might very well go and do an internship anyways, you know, through the through a career fair or some connection there. Um, or even a co-op, you know, a, a, a summer fall or a summer uh, or a spring summer, right? So, um, yeah, so some of the arch, some of the, I think, majors on campus, uh, the arch, you know, would be important to get certain courses in. For us, largely because we are, you know, such a, well, such a large major in terms of numbers of students, um, we offer courses over the summer arch that we certainly then also offer, you know, during the regular fall, spring semesters as well, since not everyone will be doing arch. In particular, yeah, come incoming um, transfer students and as juniors. So, so hopefully that's helpful. That I guess, it, yeah. So, so the curriculum uh, template would, would apply. You'd fill in the four semesters and look for an internship, probably between your junior and senior year. And okay, and so we can also go opt for and co-op for instead of an internship as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. The the only thing to be careful of um, would be, you know, some courses are fall only, some are spring only. So if you're going to go on a co-op for a summer and a fall, you need to make sure, well, programming languages is a required course and it's a fall only course. You need to make sure that you're able to take that in, in the, you know, potentially even just the one fall semester that you're enrolled in classes. So, so you know, it, it takes maybe, a, you know, a bit more planning than a four-year student to make sure, okay, here's what I'm doing over the next, you know, four semesters, and here's exactly what my plan is. Um, but, but with the right planning, yeah, definitely a co-op is, and we want to encourage you to take a co-op, you know, that's a very good experience to have, so. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, definitely, yes.
Any other questions? Thoughts, concerns? Right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you for uh, to Professor Goldschmidt and Jen Yu for joining us. Uh, I appreciate you guys uh, spending your evening with us. And thank you for all of our prospective students who signed in. Um, our contact information is up on the screen. So feel free if you want to take a screenshot of that or, uh, you know, write down our email addresses. Uh, we're always happy to kind of help and work with you, advise you uh, with any questions uh, that you may have. Um, but uh, have a great evening, everyone. And I hope you're all staying safe and healthy and are looking forward to this warm weather we're going to be getting this week. I know I am. So have a great evening, everyone. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.